we do face a tremendous challenges. And let me remind you that just less than seven months ago, Ukraine passed the second revolution in the newest Ukrainian history. It was the revolution of dignity. When people did everything to restore law and order in Ukraine, when the former president was toppled and the new government and actually the new house will be elected on the 26th of October this year. The situation, I won't say it as, as a difficult, I will name as a, an extremely complicated situation. We are facing both political, economic, financial and military challenges. We got a perfect neighbor in inverted commas. I would be happy to have another one. <laughs> I will do my best, but not sure we can handle this. Um, <coughs> what happened after the revolution? Russia decided not just to annex Crimea. It's not about the Crimea. This is about the Russian position against freedoms and liberties. They are just scared. And the Russian regime is scared to be toppled in the way as Ukrainians did it twice, actually. So they violated an international law and Russian Federation and Russian president committed an international crime, grabbing a land of independent country. I do remember the talks with a number of our Western partners when they said, look, probably we need to put aside a Crimean issue. Let's wait and see what's going to happen. But this will definitely stop President Putin in further moves to conquer the east of Ukraine. It didn't happen. You can't make the wolf vegetarian. <laughs> Even in case if he promises this. Uh, <coughs> so for today, I am really concerned about the future of my country, about the future of the European Union, about the future of Europe. And we do understand that not only Ukraine, but Europe and the entire world faced a global security challenge. We have a very fragile, extremely fragile and shaky ceasefire regime. And I am extremely skeptical about this ceasefire. But what kind of options are and were on the table? The first one is a military option. To stop, to contain and to deter Russia. We can easily do it with the Russian-led guerrillas and the Russian-led terrorists. But it's too difficult for us to fight against well-trained and well-equipped Russian military. And I can clearly state that Russian military boots are on Ukrainian soil. And this is President Putin who personally sent his military and his agents, his heavy weapon and artillery, his lethal weapon and lethal aid to Ukraine. Another option is to start some kind of peace process, which is not the best one. And uh, it's clear for us that the best way to get this peace is to have the US, the EU, Ukraine and Russia sitting at the table. Otherwise, in case if we have direct just talks with Russian Federation, they will try to do everything to outplay us. And the ultimate goal of Russian president is to have another frozen conflict in Europe and to have his hand in our belly fat, trying to control the east of Ukraine and to move further. What is the ultimate goal of Russian regime? It's clear, pro personally for me, to restore the Soviet Union in one or, no or another form. That's what they believe in and 
this is the aim of the, and the goal of this president of Russian Federation. They are furious about our European choice. And you are well aware that uh, Russia did everything to stop the ratification procedure of association agreement and DCFTA that Ukraine signed together with the European Union. Uh, <coughs> but despite this, they failed to stop the ratification and they failed to change the language of the deal. We have a number of complications related to the DCFTA or trade regime. And uh, I am ready to answer any questions uh, relatively to this particular issue. Another very challenging and extremely important issue for us is energy. You know that Russia usual, usually use energy or gas as another type of weapon. And this weapon is extremely effective because the EU is heavily dependent on Russian gas and Ukraine is extremely heavily dependent on Russian gas. We succeeded in facilitating a reverse flow from the EU member states to Ukraine. So we substituted up to 16% of Russian gas with the European one. Not, the, not with the European one, with the routes from the European Union. This would be the right definition. But again, we additionally need up to 5 billion cubic meters of natural gas to get through the winter. As the winter, the closer winter, the better trump cards Russia has in its, car, in, in its hands. Uh, Ukraine already started uh, a number of talks with Russians, but not with Russians, but we have a so-called trilateral format uh, between the EU, Ukraine and Russia, how to fix this uh, gas, problem, gas problem, and we expect to have a next round of talks on the 26th of December, uh, of, uh, sorry, uh, it's Freud. Uh, uh, no, on the 26th of uh, uh, September uh, this year in Berlin. <coughs> uh, we provided uh, a joint approach uh, together with the European Union and uh, we made a number of offers to Russians. Uh, they were rejected by a Russian uh, government and Russian Gazprom state-owned company. But despite this, uh, we have uh, a joint approach together with the European Union. Uh, in any case, Ukraine decided to brought Russians to court and uh, a few months ago, Ukrainian government uh, authorized state-owned company Naftogaz uh, to bring Russian Gazprom to court and we expect that uh, the Stockholm Arbitration Court will rule out the verdict as quick as possible but it's all about legal procedures and uh, very cheap lawyers that usually work in these kind of uh, sectors. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so we expect that the final solution could be ruled out by the court probably in a year, but uh, there is a special interim or uh, emergency procedures in, uh, under the uh, legislation and uh, Ukrainian side will apply to these emergency procedures in case if we fail to get any kind of interim solution in the trilateral format. Uh, so this is the narrative. Situation is very complicated. Uh, we did something. I won't say that we did a lot in the last six months. We passed a number of austerity package, we resumed talk with the IMF, we got the IMF loan, we got the World Bank support, uh, we made a number of reforms, uh, of domestic reforms, where we failed, we failed mainly in anti-corruption legislation. And frankly speaking, I wish to do more, but you know, having one revolution, uh, one war, and two elections just in six months, <laughs> not so easy. So we would be happy to have someone, uh, to get someone in the government as a superman, probably after the parliamentary elections, uh, this kind of superman will emerge. Uh, but uh, the government already prepared and unfolded a reform agenda, uh, which is to be implemented on a fast track. Because the quicker, the better. People expect real changes in my country. And uh, something already done and much needs to be done in, uh, in a very quick and uh, rapid and uh, accelerated way. We do commend the efforts of the United States and U.S. administration and U.S. Congress uh, because you are the flagship. You are the flagship in sanctions. Uh, you scale up sanctions and uh, one can say that Russia doesn't care about sanctions. That's not true. 
probably they don't doesn't care about sanctions, but they do really care about the Russian ruble, which dropped, about Russian foreign reserves, which are bleeding, about the Russian inflation, which is going up. And sanctions is an effect, sanctions is an effective leverage, but a mid-term and long-term one. We need to get a short-term and quick solution. And uh, the message I want to deliver is that uh, Russia first has to pull back its forces, to pull back its artillery. We need to restore the control over Ukrainian Russian border. We need to get rid of Russian agents on the Ukrainian territory. And only afterwards we can start the real peace process. On sanctions, sanctions can be lifted. If Russia leaves Crimea, this is the best way to, to lift and to eliminate any sanctions. Otherwise, this would be a Russian plan because uh, they want to go back to business as usual. And this is clear for me. And uh, one of the off-ramp strategies for the Russian Federation is to show that they are very cooperative in uh, uh, making peace in Ukraine. Uh, we are well aware how they already made this peace with their soldiers and with their tanks. So uh, my message to Russian Federation, get out of Ukrainian land, please. And this is the best recipe and the best solution to fix this dramatic crisis in Europe and to save my country and to stop the Russian aggression. Ready to answer any question you ask. You didn't disappoint us. A very powerful, I think, presentation of where Ukraine is at this point and the challenges that you face. And I want to follow up on some of these questions and try to drill down uh, on some of the issues. Let me start with a, a sort of a broad question. Uh, in your conversation, uh, you talked about Russia, uh, but a lot of the commentary was focused on the current regime, what its desires are. Uh, as you look at uh, relations over the long, longer term, if we get past this crisis, and we will at some point, do you think you have a problem with President Putin? Is that your big problem? Or do you have a Russia problem of some sort that needs to be managed carefully over the long run to ensure Ukrainian independence and sovereignty? The question you raised is very complicated and extremely important. Russian president, well, never underestimate your opponent. President Putin is a tougher guy. And I feel that he believes that he is committing a sacred mission of restoring the Soviet Union and of restoring the strength of former Russian Empire. So until President Putin will be in the office, it will be very difficult for Ukraine to take over control of Crimea. Uh, but it won't last forever. It's life. So it's clear that this is the personal policy of the Russian president to restore the Soviet Union and to make Ukraine as a part of this new so-called Union. It's clear that Russian president wants to draw the new lines and to revise the outcomes of the Second World War. It's clear that he will never give up. 
until we stop and contain Russia and deter Russia from committing an international crime. <sighs> Russian people, look, we are neighboring countries. And uh, during the Second World War, Ukraine, together with Russians, stood shoulder to shoulder against Nazis. And I was frankly astonished, just astonished, when I saw the video on YouTube, when Russian president uh, named Nazi leader Goebbels as one of the very talented person. That's, that's just awful for me. But going back to our relations, we are neighbors and our nations have uh, strong historic links. So I do believe that the time will come when Ukraine will take over control in the east of Ukraine and in Crimea. I do believe that uh, the time will come when we will turn this page, this dark page of our joint history. And I do believe that the time will come when Russians will say sorry to Ukraine. So it's a Putin problem and not so much a Russia problem. It's our joint problem. The problem is that that's not only Putin's problem. This is our joint it's problem. Let's uh, turn to the, to the gas issue. I know uh, you raised the, the upcoming winter and obviously people are concerned about that. Uh, I think the, the longer qu term question of how you're going to deal with this energy re relationship with Russia over the next five or ten years. Is there a strategy in place? Is there something that uh, you are planning to do in the, in the near term that will help uh, ease some of the dependence you have on, on Russia going forward? As I already mentioned, Ukraine is heavily dependent on the Russian gas supply and Ukraine is not the only one. The, the same goes with the European Union. So uh, regularly we have to buy from the Russian Federation up to 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas. Uh, the deal that was signed between Ukraine and Russia is not fair one. That's the reason why Ukraine brought to court Russian Federation. Uh, what we did in the last six months, we started this reverse flow, reverse flow project. Uh, actually, Ukraine substituted up to 60% of uh, the Russian natural gas, uh, which uh, is supplied today from the EU member states. Uh, the second step that uh, we have to undertake is to increase our energy efficiency because uh, we are the best one in energy consumption. The highest level of uh, energy consumption per one dollar of GDP. So we have to succeed in something. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the third issue is that uh, we signed a number of deals with uh, Shell and Chevron and other companies who are perfect in uh, new energy programs in and, and in extracting uh, gas and oil. And the thing is that the new house uh, is to pass a special legislation that allows uh, these companies to get a special tax privileges and tax exemptions uh, to increase the effectiveness of these deals. The third issue is electricity. So we started to substitute uh, gas consumption with an electricity one and the government already uh, passed a special resolution that allows to offset, uh, mm, uh, to provide a special compensation to those uh, who uh, substitute uh, gas uh, heating systems with an electricity or coal one. Uh, so the fourth one is that uh, we expect that the Stockholm Arbitration Court will rule out the verdict. And if we get the market-based approach, we are ready to pay to Russia. But we are not ready to subsidize Russian Gazprom. Uh, for example, look at the numbers. In the last three months, Ukraine saved up to 500 million dollars on the price difference between the EU and Russia. So we pay less... Uh, um, by $160 compared with the Russian price to our European partners. So it's just not, not fair. 
So uh, the fifth one is that we are ready to have the deal with Russia, but a market-based deal. If they are ready to negotiate, if they are ready to talk, and uh, if they are ready to accept our market-based approach that we jointly uh, offered uh, together with the European Commission to Russian Gazprom, we are ready to accept this too, but only on a uh, market basis. Do you, you think the Russians are prepared to accept that, or how much more pressure will it take to, uh, to get them to agree to market-based prices? I think that Russia will accept it in summer. <laughs> They're not going to make life easy for you during Never. the winter. Never. What about during the election campaign? You've got a RADA election coming up uh, on October 26. We're in the midst of a, an election campaign here in the United States. Uh, it doesn't always produce a national consensus. Uh, the question I would have for you is you look at uh, October, October 26. Do you think you're going to come out with a RADA that is going to be supportive of what the government wants to do, what the president wants to do. Uh, as you've laid out, you've got a reform plan, uh, but it's going to be important to have that political support uh, because it is going to uh, be quite painful to go through these very necessary reforms. Uh, do you think you're going to get the, the right type of RADA to move the country forward? As far as I know, you have midterm elections too. Right. So do you think this is the best time to have reforms in your country? Similarly in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, no chances to pass any kind of real reform package by this house, by this parliament. Uh, snap parliamentary elections are expected to be expected to be on the twenty sixth of October. Usually elections uh, never unite, I would say. It's quite a decentralized project. Uh, so we have a reform package and uh, it depends on the outcomes of the elections. Now what we need to have, we need to have a pro-European and, and uh, strong coalition which would be ready to pass uh, the legislation which is needed and which would be ready to bear re the responsibility. Because you know in these particular circumstances it's great to promise everyone to everything before the elections. But look, the situation is not uh, as easy as uh, one can see. So uh, the thing is that uh, this government, sometimes it's even rude and blunt when I say that look, we have to increase tariffs. You can't hear applauses from the voters. We have to increase taxes. We have to shut down and close a number of the entitlement programs because we are out of cash. But despite this, and I am just inspired by the Ukrainian people, they the approval rating of the government is still very high because they believe that these are the right things that needs to be done. But the thing, the thing is that it, it can't last forever. We need to deliver real changes as quick as possible. And the new parliament and the new coalition they are obliged to pass these reforms in order to, de to deliver real changes in every sphere, in tackling corruption, in social security system, in education, in, tax, uh, uh, in taxes, in, in everything that relates to the normal and ordinary life of Ukrainian citizens. So uh, my answer is that we need to wait until the elections we need to have the new parliament, the new coalition, the new government, and to implement everything that was prepared and already done by this government and, and by this president. And you think that the, the political leaders of the major parties understand that, that it may be a very intensely fought political campaign, but after the election is over, they'll understand the very great responsibility they have for undertaking the types of measures uh, that you've indicated in order to repair the economy rebuild this country? The thing is that Ukrainians understand this. And the, if the political leaders do not understand this, they will be toppled. That's how, that's how democracy works. And this is, I would say, a new energy of Ukrainian nation and the new mentality of Ukrainian political class. 
Ukrainian politicians must understand that they are dependent only on Ukrainian people. And if they do not meet the expectations of Ukrainians, Ukrainians will choose another one who will execute everything what people ask for. Another very important thing is that you need always to communicate to people, to explain. Even in case if you do tough stuff. But if you explain, if you say, look, if we do this, we can get that. It takes time. People probably, they are not an experts in a number of spheres, in taxes, in economy. They don't know how GDP calculates. But they feel, whether you say truth or you try to deceive them, whether you are committed to these changes or it's just political blah, blah, blah. And the key driver and the key thing in any kind of reforms is trust. If you believe in and if they believe in, we will succeed. I believe in in real changes and in success of my country, despite all hurdles and troubles we are facing today. The council focuses on, on the United States and our policy. And so the question I have for you is, uh, could you help us understand uh, a bit more what the United States could do to help you uh, with this very difficult reform process inside Ukraine, help you deal with the, with the current crisis? Uh, your president was here a short while ago. He got a very enthusiastic response. But the impression a lot of people have is he didn't come away with a lot in concrete terms. So what would be your message to us as to what you would want us to do in concrete terms to make your life a little bit easier? Uh, first of all, let me commend everything your country did for Ukraine. And we feel that the American people stand by the Ukrainians and we feel your support. You are and you were and you will be, I believe, the flagship and the key contributor to Ukrainian stability. So the world, the entire world is watching what you are doing. Russians, they wanted to split the unity between the US and the EU. They wanted to split the unity among EU member states. But we succeeded. We succeeded in uh, imposing three rounds of sanctions, in scaling up these sanctions, and in retaining this strong unity. Frankly speaking, we would be happy to get more, including defensive weapon, lethal weapon, and so on and so forth. But we do understand that every government and every country has its own complications and its own tensions inside the country. You have your own domestic politics too. And uh, no one would be happier to be accused of waging another sad world war. But we did a lot together. You are very strong in supporting Ukrainian democracy and Ukrainian freedom. What we need, we need an additional support in training, in advisors, in defensive weapons. And uh, the idea we have is that together with the US, we can launch a number of joint business projects. We, jo we, we don't beg for money. Together, we can make money. Together, we can make real business in energy and in agricultural sector. That's what we've been talking with the administration and with the USAID and uh, I am to meet the US business uh, tomorrow and the US financial sector. So let's do it. We do understand that first we need to get peace in Ukraine. But we have a huge capacity, huge resources. And if we jointly start the real projects in economic projects with the US, this would be of uh, highest importance and this would be very helpful for my country. At this time, I'd like to invite members to join in on the conversation. 
A reminder, we are on the record. So please wait for the microphone. Uh, state your name and affiliation. And please uh, ask a, a succinct question. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of interest, and we want to get in as many questions as possible. So I'll start right down here. Uh, the woman. Great, thank you. Could you please clarify your position on NATO membership? Oh, sure. Holly McCroft, um, would you please clarify whether your country will seek membership in NATO post-election? Uh, it's quite clear. In 2007, as the Speaker of the House, I signed an application to NATO member countries together with the President and with the Prime Minister asking for a MAP, Membership Action Plan. The government drafted and introduced to the House a special bill that eliminates so-called non-bloc status. This is the Soviet legacy. I can't realize what kind of blocks Russia is talking about. <laughs> Probably this one, like bricks. <laughs> uh, and this law envisaged to eliminate a non-bloc status and to be back on track on our NATO membership perspective. I am well aware that not everyone in NATO is happy with this. We do understand that Ukraine cannot join NATO in a short-term perspective. But in this case, I always quote the Bible, ask and you will be given. <laughs> Right down here in the front. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for your very informative and interesting comments. Uh, we understand that a major... Name, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Roland Paul, a lawyer. Um, that one of the um, uh, major aspects of the ceasefire is an understanding of for steps toward autonomy in the eastern part of the Ukraine. Um, what, could you tell us what you expect uh, that autonomy to include? Let me be very clear. I expect nothing good out of any kind of autonomy. We already had Autonomous Republic of Crimea. It became a part of Russia. But the law that was introduced by the president and passed by the House do not authorize any kind of autonomy for this region. The law says that it provides a so-called special status to some regions of Donetsk and Lugansk territory. The law is not concrete and not clear. It is to be added by a number of additional legislation. And the law is not signed by the president, not yet. <coughs> what do I expect? I can just reiterate that in any case, I expect another frozen conflict in Europe. And I don't want to legalize this frozen conflict. Um, <coughs> Another problem, which is crucial for us, they ruined, I mean, these Russian-led guerrillas, together with the Russian army, they demolished, dismantled, ruined the entire region. And God knows how many, the price for this, for rehabilitation and recovery, how much should we pay? Billions of grievances or billions of dollars? As far as I understand, Russians want us to pay the bill and to clear this bill. Uh, the government is uh, committed to recover the east of Ukraine, but we need the financial support. So let's start with the donations from Ukrainian tycoons, from international donors, and uh, if we act in concert, we can start this process. But the thing is that 
we cannot transfer the money, we cannot make any kind of disbursement to the east of Ukraine until these uh, territories are controlled by Russian-led terrorists. Because this is money to nowhere, they will steal them. So my take on this situation is that we were limited in options how to start this so-called peace process. The ceasefire and peace process is very fragile and shaky. Russia wants to have a frozen conflict. We have to do our best to stop an offensive Russian operation, to regroup Ukrainian military, and to try to fix and to address this problem in a very comprehensive way, using diplomatic, financial, and military options. This is the menu how to stop this violence that was made by Russians. So, if I understand correctly, if it is a frozen conflict, and that's what the Russians are driving for, it's not going to be a frozen conflict for 20 years. Your idea is to get a, a resolution as quickly as possible, to do the rebuilding and unfreeze this and bring these uh, districts in, back into Ukraine as quickly as possible. And you're thinking in terms of months, maybe a few years, certainly not a generation. Otherwise, this will be a long-lasting frozen conflict. So if we do it quickly, well, chances, there are some chances. They are minor, but let's, let's move. Good. There's a question way in the back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Bogert from Human Rights Watch. We've had investigators on or near the front lines in eastern Ukraine for the last several months, documenting, yes, Russian abuses in these areas, but also the indiscriminate use by Ukrainian military and allied forces of weapons that are killing civilians. In particular, Grad rockets, a very indiscriminate weapon that has been used extensively in populated areas. Why are you using this weapon? And why don't you stop? Let me be very clear, and the president last week made a clear statement. Ukrainian military was never ordered to use any kind of weapon against civilians. If someone has an evidences or proofs Ukrainian law enforcement office, prosecutor's office, will urgently start an investigation. And we already have an investigation against Russian-led terrorists. But if you send me any kind of proofs that you just indicated, this is the responsibility of Ukrainian government and Ukrainian authorities to thoroughly investigate every accident. Down here, right in, in the front again. Jason Rocket, Green Mantle. Um, you noted that Ukraine is dependent upon Russian gas, but what you didn't note in your remarks is that Crimea is highly dependent upon Ukraine for its water. One of the President Poroshenko's advisors was on TV this week and said that Crimea has roughly six weeks of water left, leaving it with two choices leave Crimea or to continue its aggressions towards the mainland of Ukraine to unlock the water supply. Do you agree with this analysis, analysis and which option do you think he'll take? Well, Crimean Peninsula is dependent not only on water, on gas, on electricity, and on water supply from the mainland. Uh, we are ready to deliver everything on the market-based approach? So this is my answer. Right down over here. Uh, Prime Minister, thanks for the presentation. I'm Lucio Vinha de Souza, I'm the Chief Economist of Moody's The Rating Agents. Uh, there is a specific type of international bond which was issued uh, by the previous Ukrainian government to the Russian Federation which has certain particular clauses that lead to a default potential if you have a certain amount of domestic debt to GDP. 
This also has implications in terms of the potential of cross uh, default for other types of externally outstanding uh, Ukrainian debt. If you are faced with the sort of eventuality, is there a strategy from the Ukrainian government to deal with that? The former government had a number of deals with the Russian Federation and uh, these deals uh, are and were not fair. They were more political, but you know Russians, uh, they are not idiots. They usually try to facilitate a number of hooks in every deal, including that one that you just indicated. Uh, I want to be very clear, uh, we passed a number of austerity packages we meet all PCs that were imposed by the International Monetary Fund. So we are doing our best to stabilize Ukrainian financial sector. Probably we do understand that we have to readjust the program because uh, when we started the program with the IMF, it was a peace program. For today, this is the wartime government and wartime program. But uh, we strongly believe and we are confident that Ukraine will not default. Further questions? Right down here. Uh, Jeff Laurenti. Mr. Uh, Prime Minister, you said several times that you see President Putin's larger scale object objective as a reconstitution of the USSR or the Tsarist Empire. M at least on these shores, we don't have the sense that that Russia is looking to reabsorb the Central Asian states. They don't seem to, to have that preoccupation, or Armenia or Azerbaijan, or even Georgia, the ethnically populated Georgia. Um, Ukraine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Ukraine seems to have been a target, A, because of that move toward NATO membership that you outlined, uh, which sets off all the phobias in Moscow. And second, that most ethnic Ukrainians seem to have had, until recently at least, a fairly benign view of Russians as their kinds of cousins, their you know compatible states, long associated together, uh, to uh, and you have a large Russian minority that's set you up as a target. No, so how has this crisis changed Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, at least perception of Russia? Has it forged a new national identity that may not have been particularly strong? And do you see even within Crimea? Uh, over the past eight months, perhaps, a change in people's view of who they are that would allow you to look to a strategy for uh, people in Crimea in some years asking to return to Ukraine and be part of it. Is there a change in people's thinking? What we can do, we can decorate President Putin <laughs> with a medal for the unity of Ukrainian nation. I got the last polls. The thing is that 75% of Ukrainians believe that Russia is an aggressor state. And this is not the good news. This is the reality. This is just the news. And I do remember, for example, the polls that were held two or three years ago. Everyone was so benign to Russia and even personally to President Putin. So Putin entirely lost the support among Ukrainian population. And what this aggression did, we became a country but not a territory. And we became a nation, but not just a group of people. The price is too high, very high. But you guys in the US had the same story, not the same, but a dramatic history too. To build up your strong, democratic and flourishing country. So this is the history and uh, This is the price that we paid and we are paying for our country, for our independence and for our future. There's a question way in the back.
Uh, thank you, David W. Rifkin from Debevoise and Plimpton. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned several times that uh, Russia and Putin don't pay attention to sanctions. Uh, other than sanctions and other than military action, what specific actions would you like the rest of the world to take against Russia and Putin that you think they would listen to? What's on the table? The first option is a military one, which is extremely limited. We already elaborated over this option. The second one is financial. This one is effective in case if you impose sanctions on Russian banks, on Russian Gazprom, on Russian state-owned companies. The third one is political. No more G8, just G7. Uh, no more G20, just G19. And sustainable political pressure. Well, there is the fourth option, which is an implication of the first three. To start the real talks. And the idea of sanctions is what? Just to bring them back to negotiations. And to start real negotiations over how to fix the crisis. So these are the options. Three of them are crucial. The fourth one is an implication of the first three. Question right down here. Uh, <clears throat> Roswell Perkins, Russia has been enormously successful through its information programs in putting out one side of the story. Are there any facilities in the Ukrainian side to get the facts out in a comparable way to fight the information, to fight the uh, understanding of what's really going on? Well, as far as I understand, one of the facilities is to address your audience in the culture <laughs> of foreign relations. <laughs> That's one of the best. You have another options like CNN, CNBC, and another company. <laughs> that, that's true. And, and this is another, you know, Russia waged not just the war. This is a certain type of hybrid war, which comprises military operation, soldiers with no insignia, the supply of weapon and training of Russian-led terrorists, and last but not least, an informational war, which affects the minds of everyone in the world. They have a widespread network, tough and defective lobby, even in the US. And they disseminate not the truth. This is a new type of uh, propaganda. A worst case scenario for the information. This is not the freedom of speech. Uh, what we are doing, we try to do our best to deliver the truth, to say the truth, to show the facts, uh, to be open, to be frank. Uh, we invite everyone to Ukraine. We send our envoys and uh, our folks to different EU member states just to talk, to talk, and to talk, to explain what's really going on. And despite the huge Russian capacity and despite the huge Russian uh, informational um, leverage they have, it seems that people are not idiots. They do understand what aggression means, what war means, and where is the lie and where is the truth. Question back here. Mr. Prime Minister, my name is Hari Haran. Um, two questions. One is, 
Do you one, see... One question. Sorry, okay, one question. Do you see a difference between... The first the one is just free of charge. Another one will be charged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to pay if you want. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll restrict it to one question. Do you see a difference in the intensity of wanting to impose sanctions on Russia between America and Europe? Let me reiterate once again. The US is a flagship, and the decision-making process in the European Union is much more complicated rather than in the United States. You have 28 member states. And Europe is a little bit closer to Russia in terms of geography and economy too. So uh, Russians expected to have this different approach between the US and the EU. But together you succeeded and we succeeded. We stay together, we act in concert, and uh, everything that was done in terms of sanctions was done together by the US administration and EU member states, despite all difficulties undercovered, well, explicit and implicit, that were on this way. So we succeeded. Question right down here. Uh, Wait for the uh, microphone, please. Uh, I'm Carla Robbins from the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you've gone into these, uh, this ceasefire at fire in these negotiations in a rather weakened military position. You were on a roll for a while there, and then the Russian-backed forces seem to make a lot of progress. Can you tell us um, exactly your assessment of how weak you are militarily and how much outside aid you think you need? Because you said you needed aid, and then you said you understood why the U.S. was hesitant. Exactly what sort of aid do you need, and why do you think the Obama administration is so hesitant to give it? Under the Ukrainian legislation, I am not allowed to disclose this information. <laughs> yeah, that's the right definition. Defensive weapon or lethal and non-lethal weapon. They are doing their best, I hope. <laughs> we have a question right here. Uh, Katie McFarland from Fox News. I was in Kiev in June, and it was pretty clear that it's an economic story as much as it's a military story. At what point do you just not take it anymore? Um, if you don't get the lethal uh, defensive military equipment, you're not getting the economic assistance, come home empty-handed from New York and from Washington, and it's going to be a long, cold winter, how long can you hold out before you have to negotiate and probably negotiate on Russia's terms. Look, we got what we got. And I hate to beg. We asked for the financial support. We got U one, US, uh, one US billion dollars of treasury bills. Not treasury, but loan guarantees. We got the support from the IMF. We got the support from the World Bank. We got the support from a number of G7 member states. We got some non-lethal aid. That's the picture. This is the reality. And we do understand that our future is in our hands. We heavily rely on the US and on the EU. But we do understand that we have to rely on ourselves too and even more on ourselves rather than on someone else. You are doing what you can. I already indicated that you have your domestic constraints too. And if I just go and say, look, we want to get this and that and you didn't give us, so what? This won't help neither you nor us. Uh, the Senate committee to today passed the resolution on uh, the support resolution for Ukraine. I'm not sure about the correct uh, name of this. 
assistance, assistance resolution. So after the midterm elections, we believe that your, your Congress will uh, pass an additional bill and the, probably the President will get an additional um, basement or bedrock for further support of Ukraine. But we commend and we praise the efforts of the U.S. administration, of the U.S. Congress, and of the American people that you already did in supporting Ukraine. This is my message as the Prime Minister. We thank to the United States of America. Unfortunately, we, we have run out of time. There are a thousand other questions I think we would like to ask, but we really appreciate your very forceful, your very frank answers, uh, and we welcome you back whenever you're in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you.